Welcome to This Is Money Podcast. I'm Georgie Frost and joining me and Simon Lambert today is Lee Boyce. And coming up, money for nothing. Is that the way you do it? Or will a universal basic income leave the economy in dire straits? Also today, energy costs have fallen almost 50% in a year. So why are our bills so high? We tell you how to stop the new interest rate storm, adding hundreds to your monthly mortgage repayments. And we take stock of the FTSE winners so far in 2023. Don't forget to stay up to date with all the latest breaking money news. Just go to thisismoney.co.uk or download the app. Don't forget, you can stay on top of what's going on in the markets by tuning in to the Digest and Invest podcast by eToro. Go to your regular podcast platform and listen on the go. Digest and Invest by eToro, the podcast for those interested in trading and investing. But first, 30 people in England will be paid £1,600 in government cash every month for two years for doing absolutely nothing. That's right. They don't have to do any work for it. There'll be no means testing, anything like that. That's if a universal basic income trial goes ahead. So could automatically giving all citizens the same amount of cash cut poverty and reduce the cost to the taxpayers of running a complicated benefit system? That's what the trial is wanting to take a look at. Or could it backfire and leave us all worse off and disincentivize individuals to work? Welcome to you both. Simon Lambert, first of all, universal basic income. What exactly is it? A little potted history, if you would. This is an idea straight out of left field economics, whereby you pay everybody, not just 30 people on a trial, but everybody. That's the idea. You pay everybody a set amount every month, regularly, like a salary, and provide it provides the baseline amount that they would need to live on and get by on. So to have, uh, you know, a decent living. And the idea is that this would effectively replace the benefit system. So instead of having a system whereby you are trying to catch the people who are falling through the net with another net underneath them and then support them, you're putting a net under everybody. And then if people don't work, people don't work. That's that's it. Be, perhaps you provide an income for people who are looking after their children. I was having a conversation the other week and I said, oh, well, what are you doing for work? My friend said, well, I'm not working. I'm looking after my daughter, who's like a year and a half. I said, well, you are working in that case. But it's just, it's a real generational shift. I said, that is amazing because, you know, the difference between our generation and our parents' generation is just that expectation. You ask the question of what are you, what are you doing for work? Were you working? That would not have been the expected question when me and this, this old friend were kids, you know, not so long ago. So it would provide, for example, money for mothers or fathers to look after their children it would provide a basic standard of living we wouldn't have to worry as much about people having to choose between heating and eating and all these other things and if you wanted to work on top of it and make money on top of it well that's great and actually the argument is that most people would do so and that by having people who don't have enough to live on you actually create a disincentive to work bizarrely because those people uh, feel demoralized, they feel depressed, you start to get health problems, you start to get mental health problems, and that means that those people are less likely to go on and make a success of their lives and, and go on and work and earn money on top of it. There are some obvious concerns over this. Um, for example, if we gave everybody in the country £1,600 a month, it would cost an awful lot of money. On the flip side, the benefit system costs an awful lot of money, but it would cost a lot of money. Now, funnily enough, there is a sort of form of universal basic income that we do operate and have been operating for quite some time, where we do give everyone a certain amount of money every month. And it's called the state pension. But, you know, that's a slightly different scenario, isn't it? That's to help people in their in their after work years. This is in their in their work years. But there's also quite a bit of controversy around this and the idea that effectively this gives the state a much greater degree of control over people's lives and we could talk about that in Mm -hmm. a minute uh, because we're going to go into it in more detail but that that's the basics are there any other basics of universal basic income that i didn't cover yeah no yeah thank you very much for that simon it's it's Um, money for nothing yeah essentially like it, it comes with the dire straits theme tune it's money for nothing 
exactly. So this trial then, Lee, what's this all about? What do they what do they want to find out? Essentially what Simon said there. Can you find that out with 30 people living in and where are they again? East Finchley and Jesmond or something or Jarrow, Jarrow in the northeast. Um, well, Georgie, this I, I'm sure that this story comes out like it rears its head every couple of years, and there's a big discussion about this. Uh, and we've seen it done in in other countries. So, for example, Finland was that big example where they where they did that trial some years back. And the idea, as Simon says, it is just to see. You know, those are two fairly deprived areas of Britain. You know, they would have been picked for a reason for the demographics for uh, unemployment. Especially. You have yeah. enough. Well, that's not that's not that's not poor. So well, no, but there are poor people in East Finchley, and actually, it's an area of London sort of that's had gentrification, and you have very very rich people living alongside people who are poor. Yeah, there's some of the biggest houses I've seen in my life there. I think that's where a lion went missing from a house. But anyway, <laughs> give that as it may, um, Lee Boyce. Sorry, I jumped in there. That's all right. No, it's okay. You can say that about a lot of areas. I mean, where the offices are in Kensington, like one minute you're in well, yeah, indeed, you know, indeed, a hundred million pound houses, and then you could go for a five ten minute walk up the road to North Kensington, and it's a completely different kettle of fish. Mm. So, I mean, the argument is that these areas have been picked as a kind of you know they would have the kind of right demographic, the right kind of unemployment rate, that kind of thing, uh, to see how how this works. And as Simon says it. It can be quite demoralising if you're out of work and you're on, you know, basic uh, universal uh, credit, um, which, you know, if you're single uh, and under the age of 25 is is less than £300 and it's a little bit more than that if you're over 25, you know, that's that's not a huge amount of money uh, each month to get by on. Um, and you can get into the argument is you can get into a kind of, you know, cycle of depression almost because yeah, yeah. it's very hard to uh, keep job hunting and keeping your kind of you know morale up uh but on the flip side of that you'll have people arguing that you know the benefit system's broken and you know it the, yeah. the way it works it just isn't right so trials like these you know are, are kind of there to find out if there is a better way of doing things now it's 1600 pounds a month for for people that are out of work it sounds like it's going to be a very costly bill you'd have to rip up uh the 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 you know um benefit system as it is now which would take years and years and years mm. this is just a trial that's been uh, kind of like mooted by a, a think tank called autonomy so it's nothing that's even happening officially it's just a squad kind of theorizing that this is how it could work in this country um and yeah, it's one. As I say, it's one of those things. I'm, I'm on the fence as to what the kind of real benefits are. Now, they did come out that so. So in Wales, they've had 518 year olds who've been getting 1600 pounds a month who've come out of the care system, and that's running until 2024. And we haven't had uh, any kind of feedback on how that's going yet. So we'll get the, mm. the aftermath of that next year. In Finland, in 2016, as I alluded to earlier, 2,000 unemployed people uh, picked at random. Uh, we were getting the equivalent of £500 a month. And they actually argued when they looked back on this and the conclusion on this, it feels like a, it feels like a, a university dissertation, doesn't it? But yeah. in, in the conclusion, they said that employment rose and people reported being happier and better off as a result, but they didn't roll out the scheme any more widely than that. £500 a month is also mm-hmm. vastly different from £1,600 a month. So, you know, the argument would be, do this, see how it goes with a, a very small pool of people, but it's hard to when it's 30 people it's kind of hard to know how that would then be scaled up 30 yeah. people not very many people to to see how their behaviors change and how it how it impacts them so for that reason george i'm a little bit unconvinced <laughs> by, by the whole thing before it's even done lee i just imagine though that the hard sell of this one is look i mean i don't think any of us here are, are rolling in cash but and a you know 1600 quid extra a month would be nice but I would probably just put it into savings. I don't think it would particularly benefit the economy if I was to be given £1,600 extra. It's not like I would be putting it back into it. Some people might be. It may eliminate poverty. Are we not going to widen the gap between the rich and the poor, though? £1,600 a month, uh, depending on your circumstances, it is a big amount of money, but it's also not a big amount of money. Yeah, but you invest that over... 10 20 yeah. 30 years that's pretty substantial you, you still got to live you still got to do your day-to-day life i mean that's going to suck out quite a lot of that cash i would presume yeah but um, i don't need that extra cash so i mean like i would like that extra cash but I, you know i'm i'm living comfortably without it and there's plenty of people who are so do you but, 
do you, do you not going? do you not envisage a scenario where if we were to do this on a on a great scale that it would just be taken off you effectively in tax anyway well, yeah the well, yeah but there is the so, way you get taxed you know, quite you, heavily you would anyway th- you would is it going to be more so you would be theoretically earning what you're earning now and able to then you know save that 1600 pounds a month or invest that 1600 pounds a month but somewhere that 1600 pounds a month's got to come out and they would that's where one of the criticisms of this kind of thing the other criticism of this kind of thing is what happens when central bankers or authorities start trying to make it that instead of being able to save that money you have to spend that money and that's where you start moving into things like central bank digital currencies yeah and one of the great attractions for central of central bank digital currencies for central bankers um, and governments is the idea that you might be able to give people money and then have some form of degree of control over what they can do with it so mm-hmm. at the moment you give people 1600 pounds you pay into their bank account you've got no that's it you've lost totally lost control of it once you pay it into their bank account the, the other thing is you give them 1600 pounds in cash and that's it you know you know you never know what happens to it with a bank account you they can see some what people have been spending on whether they've been saving whether they moved it into investments or savings if you introduce a central bank digital currency and then you give it to people you can time limit it that's like one basic idea so if people haven't spent it by a certain point it's gone mm-hmm. or you can make it that it can only be used for certain things. So you could use it for groceries and basics and essentials, but you can't use it for putting into an investment account or you can't use it for buying a car. You can't use it for buying alcohol. You can start to influence the decisions. And that's where a lot of the dystopian concern, a genuine concern actually over this stuff comes in because you look at authoritarian countries like China, for example, and you start seeing examples of where the state is taking control in a greater degree of people via the means of the money that they're getting. Mm -hmm. And if you've got people subsisting on this, then there's a great degree of control and they start to be able to manipulate what people can do and what people can't do. And then you start going down the Orwellian, you know, are you a good citizen route? And if you're not a good citizen, you don't get your money. And if you are a good citizen, you get your money. It's a rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, I mean, we we ran an article this week about you know why kids prefer to spend on cards rather than cash, and the reader co- the debate on reader comments basically turned into a massive debate about central bank digital currencies and governments trying to take control of our lives. Coming off the back of COVID and the lockdown, mm. you can see why there's a there's a big pot being stirred up here, you know, and also we've just seen a, an inflation spike as well. You know that contributes to it. But then there's the question as well of like, would this just be inflationary? If you give everybody £1,600, does £1,600 just become baseline? That becomes zero. And so then the price of everything goes up. I mean, the, the general principle of how inflation works is if you give people money directly, if you put money directly into people's pockets, you see inflation. And that's what's happened post COVID because governments put money directly into people's pockets and gave it to them. Print, you know, central banks printed money, governments handed it to people and people spent the money and we've seen an inflation spike. There's other elements to do with that, Ukraine war, energy and so on and so on. But that was one of the warnings that were sounded as furlough was rolled out here, as the helicopter payments were rolled out in the US and everything like that was like, this is different to post-financial crisis when you did QE and then you injected it into the financial system there we saw massive asset price inflation because the money went into the financial system it went into players in the financial system and they went and you know bumped up the price of assets this time around we've seen real inflation in the economy because the money went to real people and real people spent it I mean you know we've already seen a sort of example of universal basic income with furlough now it may be that actually the positive effects of furlough outweigh the negative effects because had you seen that many people lose their jobs the long-term impact of that on people's mental health and confidence and the economy and would they ever find their feet again that kind of question could have been huge um and if you look back to the early 90s recession there were people who's who's people who never came back from the early 90s recession and instead, we had this bridging gap of furlough where we supported people, but they effectively got paid 
for doing nothing. They didn't have to go to work. Um, mm-hmm. And that was hugely controversial. And it has arguably created a degree of inflation afterwards that would not have happened had people not been paid. I think it would be more likely that the money, not to be told what we could do with it, but would be held back if we don't do certain things. So fines for HMRC, for example, uh, ULES, uh, all those sorts of things could easily come out of this this pot of money. And actually, if inflation does go up, could the government not go, ooh, actually, we're going to have to reduce this amount that we pay you? I don't know. What, are they going to inflation link it? Because they don't inflation link oh, much costs. else. The savings tax has been a big thing. We had a story this week about what the personal savings allowance would be if it had gone up with inflation. You know, inflation is, is used to eat into things. So you've got to uplift the universal basic income oh, with inflation. Gosh. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. And like you say, they, they, you don't have to have too much of a thought experiment here to go, OK, so we have a scenario where we pay everybody £1,600 a month and we're paying everybody £1,600 a month. We've got the universal basic income. And then we look around and we go, do you know what? One of the main problems with Britain is stuff just doesn't quite work properly. We've got all these people sitting around, not going to work, that we're paying £1,600 a month. I mean, could we get them to maybe fill in the potholes, maybe? Mm. And some politician says, hey, look, guys, you know, it's not that much. All we want you to do, a couple of days a month, filling in potholes. It's not too much to ask. And people go, OK, well, I mean, you know, £1,600 a month. I don't want to lose my £1,600 a month. I mean, just a couple of days a month, yeah, I could do that. And... And I mean, at what point have you got people doing something useful for their universal basic income and sort of indentured service and things like that? It's a massive, massive minefield, this whole thing. OK, in my li- working lifetime, I think never going to happen. Lee, survey says never, never going to happen. Never going to happen. Simon, survey says already happening for 30 people at the moment. Well, it's not, though. That's the thing. It's not. It's not. This is a proposed plan. So there you go. Never going to happen. Uh, no, no I, don't, I don't think we're going to see universal <laughs> basic income. I, I genuinely don't think we're going to see universal basic income rolled out, despite the, the, the fears of, of many people. I don't, many think, people. I don't think the gate that I don't think that there is an overarching game plan to bring in universal basic income, uh, bring in central bank digital currencies and gain control over the populace so that the world is effectively enslaved to the elite because i think that all evidence suggests that governments and the elite are actually catastrophically dumb and could never pull something like that off there you go right moving on from this finally some good news in the energy market wholesale prices have plummeted almost 50 percent in a year marvelous news right hang on During that same time, our gas and electricity bills have gone up almost 26% on average. So what on earth is going on? What are wholesale prices and why are they falling? Essentially, it's what energy suppliers pay to get the gas and and electricity that we use in this country. They've been falling. There's a couple of reasons why they've been falling. But one of the big reasons is just the fact that uh, there's a lot of gas and liquid petroleum gas being stored across Europe. So just the reserves have gone up and the prices have since now come down after spiking massively, which is what's led to, to the higher bills. The government having to step in with the energy price guarantee and all of that kind of thing. And we've just come out of the back of a winter in which a lot of us have faced energy bills that we've just never higher than we've ever faced before. And if anyone is listening to this podcast and still had their heating on uh, at the end of May, start of June, which I'm telling you was happening in this. I was battling it hard, Georgie. I was like, the heating is not coming on. It's been been pretty cool in the southeast uh it has it's been a, there's been a there's been a battle in this household for the i can't after april no just put some jumpers on but you know these are the kind of discussions that people are having so anyway these these wholesale prices are, are, are dropping but you know we're still facing pretty high energy bills we've got the new off gem price cap coming in from july at 2074 pounds so that should bring prices down for us a little bit there's been murmurings about fixed tariffs make it a comeback but you know when that's going to be probably after july you might start seeing a bit of movement but we'll see but th- there's three main reasons why it's not being reflected into our energy bills th- these lower wholesale prices and the f- first one of it is even though the house wholesale prices are coming down there's just there's still 
a double where they were historically, uh, according to an expert called Mo Insight. So they're still a lot higher than what they were before. They're just they're coming down from the really, really massive spikes. You know, he's saying in, in this comment that they were six times the normal pricing. So they've gone from six times normal pricing to double normal pricing. And also you got to remember that the government stepped in with this and, and the guy that's uh, talking about this, Robert Buckley at Cornwall Insight, was saying that uh, the average energy bill would have been £4,279 if it wasn't for the energy price guarantee capping bills at two and a half grand. I mean, that that is massive. Sometimes I think we're in danger of forgetting that and just how generous that was and how mad energy prices had gone. The second the real big reason is a lot of energy firms will buy their, uh, will lock in, quite far in advance to make sure that they don't run out of reserves it could be months it could be years and actually that's why uh, some of the smaller players you know we had that spell of just lots of smaller players going bust or smaller energy supplies it's because they were buying it more short term um and then sort of running out and then having to fork out the really 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 high prices the bigger companies don't tend to do that as much they tend to hedge a little bit more to try and protect from any kind of rapid fluctuations, which is there's lots of things that have been going on in the last sort of decade, decade and a half, in which we've just been so used to things being rock bottom prices, whether it's energy, whether it's, uh, you know, base rate being at 0.1% and we're used to paying hardly anything for, for borrowing, all that kind of thing. And then all of a sudden there's been this perfect storm of things just going through the roof. And, and energy has been one of those things um, which has been steady over the last 10, 15 years, you know, it's just, we've just been used to paying quite cheap prices for our energy. And then it just spiked just out of nowhere and it just caught a lot of the smaller players out. And the last one, and again, I think people kind of, they know this, but they kind of then forget about it a little bit. But it, the your household energy bill isn't just the gas and the electricity. There's a lot that makes up the bill. The second highest thing is just net, the network costs then the operating costs, and then uh, 15% of the bill is environmental and social obligation costs. Um, so th- there's things that are in the bill, in your bill, that are not the wholesale prices. It's like infrastructure, for example, um, and we all pay standing charges. Standing charges have gone up quite a lot. Standing charges are a massive bugbear to people who so some some homes are just, you know, if you didn't put on your gas and electricity whatsoever, you would still be paid at the paying the standing charge. There's no way to dodge that. You've got to remember how you get your electricity delivered to your home, you know, the infrastructure that's around it, and you and you pay for that. And we've also, as part of our bill, part of the bill has been helping customers who have been with energy supplies that have gone bust mm-hmm. and part of the uh, mitigating them over to other bigger energy firms that have hoovered them up, that protection. So there's there's those three main reasons that we're currently not seeing a, a massive massive downturn in in our energy bills but it might be a different picture we might be talking on this podcast in three months time and there might be a, a load of new fixed tariffs coming in we might have an off gem uh price cap murmurings of it going lower and maybe we're over the worst of it but as i always say i'm not making any predictions <laughs> Never. I, don't know. I don't know i don't know what's gonna happen simon controversial thing here is this element of the price, the wholesale price, and the wholesale price that's often quoted is basically if you wanted to buy energy tomorrow, and that is down a lot. Unfortunately, well, I don't know, whichever way you want to look at it, a lot of the energy firms that just bought their energy tomorrow to give to you on that day, they've gone bust. They they went bust in that first wave of firms going bust as the energy crisis hit because they hadn't hedged, um, which basically is is a way of making sure that you aren't caught out by a price spike, um, buying in advance, having the, you know, the, the contract there ready to, to buy in advance rather than having to just basically go, my energy customer is using that much energy today, so I need to buy this much energy today. And then you just have to pay whatever price the market sets. Instead, you go, well, I think all of my energy customers are going to use about that much energy over this period of time. And so I'm going to have a contract to buy that much energy over that period of time that I've matched a and B. So the controversy comes from the fact that that next day price is very low, but then also those prices for buying in advance are still relatively high. They're higher than that buying, you know, tomorrow price and everything like that. But there's some debate over to what degree this hedging is genuinely responsible for people's bills remaining high 
or not, it's very difficult to unpick this. I think you need to be a, be an energy trader to really kind of understand this stuff. And there's definitely an element going on there. But there's also an element of there's no competition. So energy firm A and energy firm B might both be hedging their energy costs and they might be able to buy energy this far in advance and they've bought it for this. And then, you know, if you've got these customers, but they're not competing to then offer those customers the best price. So because there's no switching, there's no competition, customers are just having to take what they get. And actually for most people, because there is no switching, there is no fixed deals or anything that the, what they get is basically the energy price guarantee. So the energy price guarantee uh, or the, sorry, the energy price cap now for, as of July is, is, sucking competition out of the market in that sense there are some rules that were brought in by Ofgem to do with the kind of supplier failure and everything like that that might impact whether switching comes back because it's become more expensive if you take somebody else's customer you've got to kind of reimburse them a bit and there's this argument that that's going to discourage switching and also on top of this there is the suspicion that there might be a bit of profiteering going on here a bit of well, if we can keep prices high, let's keep them high. And let's face it, actually, you know, many of those energy customers, energy companies were staring down the barrel of a scenario where they had to provide customers with energy that they had paid more for than they could charge the customer for in recent times. So, you know, it, it's kind of swings and roundabouts. And then, as Lee said, there's all these other costs. And the network costs, for example, have gone up substantially because of the, you have to balance the supply demand scenario for renewable energy, for example, which is quite complicated, this whole thing with the grid. Um, then also we've got to prepare the grid for the electrif electrification of the economy. We're trying to shift away from gas. We're trying to shift towards electric cars and all these other things. So it's become more expensive to do that whole getting power to people thing and then on top of that you also have the scenario where we for some bonkers reason pay dirty energy prices for clean energy so we're quite good at producing renewable energy in this country you know we've actually give ourselves a little bit of a pat on the back we've done quite a good job of that could still do more but we've done quite a good job of it yet for some reason we pay the same amount for the electricity that comes from the sun or the wind or the waves as we do that comes from the electricity um, from buying expensive gas and burning it, which is totally nuts and mm -hmm. probably something that the government should maybe get its act in gear and sort out. So there, there you go. And there are there's talk of that. For example, you know, the whole like if you live near a wind farm, you might get cheaper energy and things like that. But it it does seem totally bonkers that we are still beholden to the most expensive way of generating electricity as we try to electrify our economy. Right. That's it for part one. I'm joined now by Sam North of eToro for our weekly look at what's been happening on the markets. Sam, how's the past week been? Yeah, well, I was saying last week I wouldn't have minded too much in getting this week out of the way just because next week looks so interesting. However, I, I definitely spoke too soon as there were a couple of shocks. Both the RBA and the Bank of Canada surprised the market and raised interest rates again, which now cast doubt on whether the Fed are going to keep their rates the same <clears throat> next week or they're going to skip the meeting I mean, albeit other than that, in truth, it was a pretty quiet week. The VIX, the volatility index, the fear index is at pre-pandemic lows. Volumes are waning. And the S&P 500 on Thursday's close confirmed that it's now in a bull market, being over 20% up from those recent lows. The question, of course, is can that run continue or will all the hard work be undone as we head into the summer months? And... It does raise questions, doesn't it, about how much of the, the market performance we saw in the early part of the year when there was the expectation that, you know, rate rises were going to pause. So maybe we could turn a bit back to growth is going to tail off. It makes it tricky for the second half of the year. It does. It really does. And, and I think when looking at next week, the, the two main events, one is going to be that inflation number out of the US on Monday. So if that comes in a little bit you know, sticky, a little bit higher than we expect, then maybe the Fed are going to raise rates uh, on their meeting. Sorry, the inflation is on Tuesday, the, the interest rate decision on the Wednesday. And if they raise rates or they suggest in their 
you know, dot plot, future projections, press conference that we're not going to see cuts uh, later this year. The market's going to have to be priced. So it's going to be a really, really interesting sort of start and middle to that week. I can think right now it's it's quite hard to call uh, the p- probability of a, a hike or a cut or a pause have been changing really by the hour. Uh, also next week, we've got ECB meeting. Uh, we've got the latest GDP month on month figure from the UK and the jobs data. We've got the Bank of Japan policy announcement, which is one to keep an eye on too, and some Chinese data uh, as well, plus something called quadruple witching on Friday. So it's just going to be a really, really busy week. I mean, look, famous last words, uh, but there will be volatility next week. And we're going to know a lot more about the direction of travel by next Friday's close. Right. Well, I'll speak to you next Friday when we know what's happened. Thanks very much for that. Thanks, Simon. Welcome back. Home buyers and homeowners looking for a new mortgage are facing miserable market conditions. Lenders continuing to push up rates and pulling nearly 1,000 deals. More than 1.5 million homeowners will need to remortgage this year and they'll be hit with shock bill rises, putting further pressure on already stretched household finances. So what should you do if your loan deal is soon to expire? You have a guide on your website to navigating the mortgage minefield. Um, how bad is it out there, Lee? Uh, give me some figures, if you would. I uh, Before we wade into this, I have, honestly, this last week or two, had so many friends ask me about what's happening in the mortgage market again. And that, for me, is the gauge of things are starting to get a little bit manic out there again. Uh, because I have, you know, we all know people that have taken up mortgages and, you know, potentially two years ago now facing hundreds and hundreds of pounds extra onto their onto their mortgage deal for each month that they're going to struggle to find. And we've spoken about this on the podcast a few times. Um, and again, actually, before I wade in any further into the to the guy that we've got on there, uh, HSBC yesterday, one of the biggest lenders in Britain, one of the biggest mortgage lenders, just withdrew all mortgages uh, to residential borrowers, which was a kind of move that came quite short notice. And in fact, it was giving people till 5 p.m. And then it stopped at 3.30 because it was just being swamped with people uh, trying to lock in and and fix their mortgage or or get a new mortgage deal. And that's, for me, again, another sign that we might be about, we're facing mortgage mayhem part two, the next part of the saga that we didn't really want to see after the the part one, uh, which started happening in September. So it's a little bit, worrying for people out there especially if you're about to remortgage or you're about to buy a new home hundreds of home loans have been pulled since uh, the end of may when basically the kind of inflation figures weren't quite what were expected and bank of england now economists are saying that it could base rate could go more like 5.5 percent that seems to have spooked lenders a little bit it's sort of like how do you not panic in that kind of scenario and then we've got david hollingworth a very good friend of of this is money mm. uh, mortgage broker at lnc uh, talking about hsbc he said we haven't seen such a big lender withdraw rates like this in 2023 it's quite radical i mean that is quite radical yeah. just to sort of pull the rug and go actually we're, we're withdrawing all these it was at the top of the best buy list because it hadn't repriced for a whole week it was it may have found himself at the top of the best buy list literally because it hadn't repriced its rates in a Goodness. week i mean that that is quite something isn't it so this guy that we have it on our website it's it's a bit scary but over the last last two weeks alone uh, a two-year <laughs> fixed <laughs> two-year fixed rate mortgage deal becomes 68 pounds more expensive based on a loan of three hundred thousand pounds that's in just two weeks um yeah, it's 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 a scary, rapidly uh, moving thing. Um, the cost of a two-year fix today is four hundred and twenty pounds a month higher than it was a year ago. Oh. Um, that's five thousand forty pounds more every year on a three hundred thousand pound loan. They are scary figures for people. That's yeah. why I'm from friends who have bought this, particularly in the pandemic, who potentially are seeing house prices we, we've been talking about this again on the podcast a little bit house prices are kind of seem to be edging back a little bit off of the summer peak um and if all of a sudden you've not got much equity in your home and you're facing mm-hmm. mortgage rates going up i remember talking about this about a year ago that this was a kind of thing that might be coming down the line you know there's millions of people that are coming up to to need to fix you know or get a new mortgage deal and they don't know what to do um, and I'll be honest with you, I don't know what to tell them. 
I mean, I can't. You can't start saying we'll get a two year fix, get a five year fix, just go on an SVR, talk to your broker. You know, we can't give that kind of advice. It's it's a, you know depends on your circumstances. But when we're seeing lenders doing this and these radical changes, radical taking out, pulling mortgages, it starts to create panic. And that's exactly what has happened. And that's why HSBC was struggling with a flood of phone calls yesterday trying to lock in rates. You know, there's 4,686 residential mortgage deals that was on Monday available, down from 5,235 just two weeks ago. It's quite a big chunk. And the ones that have stuck around, you know, have height rates quite a lot. So Santander up 0.43, BIPs, uh, Halifax 0.3, Leeds Building Society 0.8. Them some big, big, big yeah, changes, yeah, yeah. And, and and that's why you know I'm saying that these 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 payments are shooting up for people, and mm-hmm. that's also why I'm saying I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what to tell you, as in terms of and you're not going to predict you, anything either. Lately. What you can do, it's it's just impossible to predict at the moment, George. You know, we we had the the kind of spike in all the rates really fast on the back of the September mini budget, uh, and then between sort of then and February it was quite mad and then it also starts simmering down and it's been simmering down and simmering down and now as i say this feels like a bit like madness part two um mm. yeah well there we go simon um some less than positive stuff coming uh from lee there from you anything more hopeful perhaps than that mm. I have a huge degree of sympathy with anybody in the position where they need to remortgage now or over the next few months or have agreed to buy a home uh, and need to find a mortgage. I mean, I guess at least with the latter option, you can take the decision to go, OK, fine, we're just going to pull out it's not time to buy or we're going to have to negotiate on the price to take this into account or we're going to have to do something you have a degree of control over the situation you have to remortgage then you have to remortgage you could go on to your lender's standard variable rate the problem is your lender's standard variable rate is probably really quite high so for example um you could be paying seven and a half percent um you could be paying nearly eight percent so uh you know santander's follow-on rate and santander is a major mortgage market player just for example i'm just looking at it 7.75 percent i mean that's going to cost you a lot of money if you're going from a a two percent fix to a 7.75 percent standard variable rate that's very expensive so then it's the question of well i probably better take a new fixed rate but then you're looking at fixed rates at a point when there is a mortgage spike and we're back in the we're back in the sort of almost like the aftermath of the, what should we call it? Quasi Quarteng's disastrous mini budget. Today we'll call it disastrous. Mm-hmm. We call yeah. it ill-fated. We call oh, it infamous. Yeah. We call it many, many other things. Yeah. Anyway, you know, that one. Um, and there's a bit of a panic going on in the mortgage market. Now, it turned out that anybody who dived in and took a mortgage, maybe mm, October, kind of early November time, ended up overpaying in a sense, for that fix, because they fixed at a much higher rate than they could have done if they'd waited a few months. Now, it could be that that's what's happening now. There is a bit of an inflation panic coming in. This is off the back of a number of things, but also the most recent inflation figures. Is is that core inflation figure that got everybody worried? Is the inflation not falling as much in the UK, perhaps, as it is everywhere else? Does that totally justify What's going on at the moment? HSBC saying we're pulling all our mortgages in four hours. Actually, no, sorry, guys, two hours, they're gone. You know, HSBC is quite a big bank. Um, Is this entirely justified? Are you just going to be fixing now at a rate that's higher than if you just sat on your hands and waited and allowed for the the panics to subside will be lower? Or, you know, are, are genuinely interest rates going to keep going up and, you know, the market is running ahead of itself, but then it's going to stay at that higher level. And actually that lull that we had, early this year through to kind of easter time was uh you know was just a little was just a little pause and a little lull and actually you would have got lucky if you'd taken one then nobody knows and it's a math so it turns it into a huge gamble 
And I think that the property market in this country is is already enough of a casino when it comes to actually buying a house, working out whether you can afford it. Um, and, you know, our price is going to rise, the price is going to fall, that you don't want the mortgage market to be a casino as well off the back of it. And that's what it's turned into at the moment. So I have a huge degree of sympathy with people. The one thing I would say is don't panic. Check what your situation is. Go to thisismoney.co.uk forward slash mortgage hyphen finder. You will find our mortgage finder service there, which is powered by LNC, which is a mortgage broker. It's totally free, no obligation, but you can put in your mortgage, your home's value, and you can find the loans that you might be able to take. If you want to, you can go speak to them and they'll help you out. Totally free, no obligation, but you don't even have to do that. You could just go through the calculator, work out where you stand. And once you know where you stand, at least you're informed and then you can start making decisions. And then when you start talking to your bank, we you start talking to a mortgage broker, you know what's available on, on the whole of the market. Um, plan ahead. If you've got you know a mortgage coming up within the next six months, look at it now. You don't have to take that rate. You could lock that rate in. And with most in most scenarios, you don't have to take it. You don't have to pay any money. Don't pay any booking fees now. Add them to the loan and then pay them off when you take the loan out because that's the cheapest way of doing it. But you, you, you're you not locked in, but you've got the option. And having the option is good because mm-hmm. the good news is that in five months time, when you actually need to remortgage, rates have come down and you say to your broker, actually, rates are cheaper now. Can you go find me one of those cheaper ones? And they go, yeah, sure, of course. Here you go. And you get that cheaper rate. But if rates have gone up, you've at least got yourself that one that you looked into now. Um, and if you are struggling, speak to your mortgage lender do not bury your head in the sand yeah. not make payments and do all those other things go seek help from one of the debt charities from systems advice or something like that um and you know because the worst thing you can do is stick your head in the sand and not make your payments because that's going to cause you massive problems in years to come good advice there simon i should also say um i like the fact that you're right a lot of the time simon but Sometimes I don't. And you've been saying this for some time now that you think there's worse to come here. And it looks like you're right. How bad do you think this could get for people? I mean, if these figures are right and that's what people are staring down the barrel of hundreds of pounds extra a month. I don't know where they get that money from. Yeah. So my comment on this has been a few times over the last sort of few months that we sort of think we've got away with this big rise in interest rates, this incredibly fast escalation in interest rates from practically zero to, you know, quite high compared to practically zero. Um, And I think the same is true of the the Bank of England and the Monetary Policy Committee. And they're very focused on inflation. They've been coming for a real kicking for not getting ahead of the curve on inflation, despite the bank actually being one of the first to raise interest rates. But they, they... so I think that they, they're going to take the path of least resistance and the path of least resistance is to basically continue a tough stance on inflation. And ultimately, what happens is in order to bring that inflation under control, and it's not the inflation that we've already seen, it's not the 8.7% that's looking backwards, it's what's going to happen over the next six months or 12 months that they're trying to rein in. That potentially involves crashing the economy and crashing the economy by massively whacking up the amount of money that people have to pay on their mortgages. I, I, is that a very fair way to treat people in the aftermath of all the stuff they've had to deal with in recent years? I'm not entirely sure that it is. And, you know, monetary policy is always described as a very blunt and very imprecise tool. And we are learning a lesson about quite how blunt and quite how imprecise it is. And there's also a huge degree of intergenerational unfairness going on here because this is largely impacting younger people. It's impacting their ability to buy a property. Although, actually, if they don't already own a property, if this brings house prices down, that's a good thing for them. But it's impacting those who have climbed onto the property market, paid way, way, way more in terms of a multiplier of their wages than their parents' generation did, um, who are sitting on tons and tons of housing equity. And although that generation, the parents' generation, had double-digit interest rates and things like that, house prices were a much lower multiple of wages. And also central banks, including the Bank of England, promised people that when rates went up, it would be slow and it would be gradual. Mm. And, you know, that this would... It was implied that this would not happen. And they owe a generation of people an apology. Indeed, Simon. Right. Finally, before I let you go, markets haven't had the 
easiest first six months of a year. Inflation remains high and no sooner had the banking system stabilised after crises at SVB and Credit Suisse. We had all the debt default brouhaha over in the States. Now, despite this, though, some companies managed to make significant gains over the last six months. Those in the FTSE 100 saw increases of up to 73% in their share prices, while companies in the FTSE 250 saw increases up to 72%. So, Simon Lavert, let's take a look at the winners and, and, of course, the losers as well. But let's be positive and let's go with the winners first. OK, so in the FTSE 100 top five risers, in at number five, we have BT Group with a 33% rise. Making an appearance at number four is Flutter Entertainment with a 38.6% rise. 3i Group is in at three with a 44.3% rise. And then we've got Rolls-Royce, the did, did, airline did, did, did. engine maker, not the car maker. Don't get yeah. confused. That's owned by BMW. That's a Eurovision entry. Um, this is the good old British Rolls-Royce, and that's up 56.99%. And then stomping forwards and leading the way is Melrose Industries, which is up 73%. With the FTSE 250 risers, we've got Wizz Air in at 5, 46.7%. Marks and Spencer, the high street store wall, is back on the up at 47.96%. Mitchells and Butlers, everybody's gone down the pub, 49.28%. Where the spoon? Everybody's gone down the path. Yeah. 64.86%. <laughs> but they're saving a bit of money at that We're point. We're eating fine Aston Martin drinking. roaring nice. ahead. Nice. 71.43%. So there's a bit of variety in all that, Simon. Uh, perhaps less so in the 250. But um, any, any patterns here? Is it down to the individual companies doing well? Is it because they've come from quite a low base? Uh, I was just thinking too much about doing it in my chart show voice. I haven't even like. All right, you know, it was well done. Yeah. You, you'll never <laughs> guess who spent these formative years listening to the chart show on the radio and recording songs. No, yeah. I tell you what, the, the the thing, the theme that runs through all of these is a lot of these are companies that have suffered big, big share price drops over recent years. They've really, really beaten up. Um, so, for example, if you take Aston Martin shares, those have risen substantially this year you've got a 70 percent rise but they are still way way down on where they were um marks and spencer again it's done really really well this year okay that reflects uh the fact that there's been a real upturn in performance people think that m&s is finally back on the up but those shares are you know they're way below where they once were um, and, and this is true of, of most of those companies in that scenario. I mean, trading at one pound eighty eight today, Marks and Spencer shares, just to put this, um, you know, into perspective, that compares to December 2021, they were at uh, two pound forty one. So that was pre COVID. That was sorry, that wasn't even pre COVID. That was in the sort of COVID recovery period. If you go back to 2000 uh there you go, 2000 and what are we looking at? 2007, the, you know, the glory days, £6.57. You know, so they're still w- way, way down on where they were. Um, I think that it, it's an example of the performance of, val- of value over growth. Yeah. That, that's the thing that marks out most of the stuff in this list is it's what might be picked up by a value fund manager who goes looking for undervalued companies who have been beaten up to a degree in terms of share price terms that doesn't necessarily reflect their prospects you know you could there's two ways of value investing you just go buy the cheapest 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 possible stuff and if you buy 100 of them then actually the fact that maybe 15 of those will recover to such a huge degree allows for the fact that another 60 of them will do terribly and another 15 will go bust um but these are the sort of the the ones where people look at them and go okay you know something's something's gonna get better here bt for example Mm. it's had a lot of troubles in the past but it, it still runs a lot of our broadband a lot of our communications there's been a maybe a takeover thing going on there a guy called patrick trahi who's been buying up a big stake of the company um flutter flutter's been doing well off the kind of u.s gambling thing and stuff like that rolls royce rolls royce is a is an engine maker but rolls royce shifted its business model very successfully um some years ago to instead of being paid for the engine 
it effectively gets paid for the kind of maintenance. So it gets paid almost by the mile that planes fly. So the more they fly, the better Rolls Royce does. So that was really great until COVID happened. And then it was really, really bad. It's had turnaround plan after turnaround plan. It's got a new boss. It's cut costs. It's done these other things. But, you know, there's more planes in the sky, spending much more time in the sky now. So there are fund managers, there are investors who would have looked at Rolls Royce and gone, well, look, you know, okay, we might have to be patient here, but it's going to come back. You know, we don't think it's going to go bust. It's going to come back. Um, Aston Martin, I, I could not talk about a company with a checkered financial past, but it is making some headway and it had been doing very, very well. Everybody's really excited about it. And then it absolutely tanked and it's had to do rights issue, rights issue and so on and so on. Another change at the top and all that kind of stuff. But it's making this DBX SUV and that is very profitable for it. And it's selling quite a lot of those. Um, and people can look at the amount of expensive SUVs that people like Porsche have made. And they've made, you know, a huge amount of money on that. Lamborghini, the Urus has been like hugely successful for it. They look at Aston Martin and they go, well, yeah, surely he's got to do well off the back of that. And it's also selling these one off um, hyper cars for incredible amounts of money to very, very rich people, which are absolute profit machines. Um and yeah, so it's, it's all little examples like that. And the losers, Simon. The biggest <sighs> FTSE 100 fallers. <laughs> Ocado down 42.95%. Yeah. Ocado is a growth company. It's a disruptive growth company. Its price soared. It, it's not a grocer. It's a tech company, according to Ocado. And we all know what's happened to tech companies over the over recent times. And, you know... You can get 5% on a savings account now, a one-year fixed savings account. If you're an investor, you can get maybe a 5% return from a from a 4% return from a kind of money market fund or something like that. You can get a high, a high return from a relatively safe asset. So the return that you require from a speculative jam tomorrow, we're going to do really well and change the world asset you require a much greater return yeah. each year to do that. And so you go, okay, well, maybe I'm just going to go for the safer thing, particularly as things look a bit disturbing. Anglo-American, uh, big mining company, resources company, that's been hit. And then two big FTSE 250 fallers, uh, Capricorn Energy down 64.99%, and Future uh, down 42.27%. Future is a publisher, done really well. Um, but again, it's you know seen as a growth stock. So, so will it continue? Or will these be the future values? Well, I mean, we've seen a bounce back in terms of some of the, the growth sector earlier this year with the expectation that interest rate rises would pause. We're now seeing a bit of a wobble there. Has the world changed? Are we going to go back to where we were? I don't know, but that's why you need a diversified portfolio of different companies that do different things and don't all get hit by the same set of circumstances. So when something goes bad and one of them gets hit, something else does well. Indeed. All right, then that's it for this week. You can keep up to date with all the latest breaking money news. Just go to thisismoney.co.uk or download the app. And if you have any comments or questions for the team or anything you'd like them to look into, Simon. You can email us at editor at thisismoney.co.uk. You can tweet us at thisismoney and you can come to thisismoney.co.uk forward slash podcast. Join in the debate. If you read the comments and find all podcasts past. And if you like our podcast, why not rate us wherever you found us? It helps other people find us too. Don't forget, you can stay on top of what's going on in the markets by tuning in to the Digest and Invest podcast by Etoro. Go to your regular podcast platform and listen on the go. Digest and Invest by Etoro, the podcast for those interested in trading and investing.